Guys, what's up? It's Dr. Zubin Damania. Welcome to the ZDog MD show. Ah, I love being back in the Bay Area, and here's why. Because smart, crazy, cool people come by the studio just like it's nothing, and they want to talk about things that actually impact our patients and us as caregivers. Today, I have Dr. Bob Harrison. He is a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and specializes in occupational and environmental medicine. Now, when I was a medical student at UCSF, I had a lecture from, it could have been Bob, it could have been one of his colleagues. I, the whole thing, I, PTSD and the whole thing is blocked out, but I remember distinctly going, uh, yeah, occupational medicine is super important because we spend so much of our time at work. And not only that, but there's the socioeconomic status of people who are in jobs that, you know, as it is, they're sort of at risk for being unemployable, whether they're living on the margins or whatever, often have very high risk stuff. And then you even think about hospital workers and the, and the risk they're put at. Uh, you think about occupational medicine as being crucially important. Now, it turns out that Dr. Harrison, described the first case in the US of silicosis, a pulmonary disease in artificial stone fabricators, people who make your kitchen countertops and stuff like that with artificial stone. And since then, he's described other cases where there were up to 18 cases and two fatalities in these workers, and it's still probably under-recognized and under-managed. And so today, we're going to talk about it. He's going to uh, explain what's going on and how we can better recognize it. Bob, thank you and welcome. Well, thank you, Zuman. And first of all, I want to thank you for remembering at least that one lecture you got in medical school, <laughs> whether it was me or somebody else, and that you actually realize that what somebody does for a living makes a difference. You are my model medical student. See, and no other professor has ever said that because everyone else was trying to get me expelled. So you're the first person to appreciate me, okay? So I appreciate that, Bob. Thank you. Well, you're, you're very welcome. I'm glad to be here and talk about what's happening. Can, and can I tell a quick story? So I, today I had a call with an old UCSF alumnus uh, for something unrelated. And I said, oh, in just a, an hour, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Bob Harrison about occupational lung disease and, and, and similar. And he said, oh, my gosh. Bob Harrison, in the 80s, when this guy was a student, he did a research project with you on hotshot firefighters who jump into wildfires and the potential lung disease that can happen, and he still remembers it so vividly. So you had a real impact on people. Well, thank you. And that was one of the most interesting studies that I did. Um, and uh, that was involving lung disease. It's very relevant today because of all the wildfire smoke. Um, we could spend a whole other show talking about wildland firefighters. Uh, my daughter's significant other is one of those hotshot crew members. I just saw him over the weekend. Uh, we spent many hours talking about his health hazards, uh, respiratory effects, lung problems in those firefighters. Um, that's a problem that's also affecting the general community now. Uh, but I know we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> um, that uh, that's fascinating. You know what? I'll that's tell you just what. another example of an occupational health issue. Because I'm so interested in that, that if we can get back to it, because I want to talk about the silicosis first, because I think it's important that people who are just listening to the beginning understand what's going on. Then I want to get into how you got into occupational medicine and why it's so important and how other people who are interested in this can get into that. And then I want to wrap back to the firefighters, because it, like you said, it's so topical and timely right now. Um, so... Tell me about what's going on with these stone workers or artificial stone workers. So if I or you were to redo my kitchen. I'm I just did it. You just did it. Mm -hmm. um, what material did you use? We used natural granite, a white granite. Well, that's so yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so about 80% of the products now are what's called artificial stone. Mm. And it comes in a wide variety of different colors and palettes. Um, it turns out it's actually a very good product from the point of view of renovating your kitchen. Um, it's very stain resistant. It doesn't chip. Ah. And it's pretty competitive now in price with the natural stone that you're using. Um, I can buy it all over the country now. Um, it's uh, rated by many uh, consumer magazines as number one material. Really, what, what, is there a trade name for it or something that? Yeah, um, so the common names that you might recognize are Caesar Stone, mm. Silestone, Silestone. Uh, Cambria, uh, Zodiac, 
Uh, these are common names. Uh, Vicastone is another one. They're also great names for vape juice, which I'm sure is not an occupational hazard. Yeah, we won't talk about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, so this artificial stone. stone. Yeah, so it's artificial stone. It's a very popular product right now. Um, and the story of that material really starts in the mid-1970s with an Italian by the name of Toncelli, Marcello Toncelli, um, in southern Italy. And he invented this material that contains 93% silica. So it's very fine silica sand. You mix it with a polyester resin and put it in a big mold, compress it under vacuum, and those little polyester molecules coat the silica sand and it becomes extremely hard. And silica is the predominant uh, entity in quartz, correct? Correct. So this product may also be known as a quartz countertop, but it's really not quartz. Uh -huh. It's artificial silica mixed with this chemical. And what makes this different is the 93% silica content. So the material that you use probably contains about 40 to 50% silica. Now that's dangerous if it's cut or polished or ground. But if you take a product that has 93% silica and you cut, polish, grind it, it releases very fine silica particles into the air that are then breathed into the lungs and cause scarring or silicosis. So, so because it's, it's artificially enriched in silica, it's worse than, say, a standard granite that has quartz or some silica in it, 40%. This is more like, what, how much, 83%? This is about 93%. 93%. So it's over 90%. So um, it's almost like silica in a slab or silica in a box. Pure silica with It's almost resin. pure sil silica mixed with uh, a little bit of this polyester resin that becomes very hard. Mm. So it's like particle board, but with, with stone. Exactly. In a way. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and 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 a lot of this is made from recycled stone, mm. aggregates that then finally pulverized. Mm. Now, um, Zubin, when you redo your kitchen, you're dealing with your contractor. Oh, I gosh, would assume. Don't remind me. Actually, he was, he was great. <laughs> yes. Big shout out. Um, now, the contractor or your designer, let's say, will tell you, give you some advice. You'll pick out this material in a tile or stone store, maybe a big box store. Mm. Um, you'll have it matched to your um, to your paint or your or to your floor, and then your contractor goes away and says, "Zoom in! I'll bring this back in six weeks. You'll have a kitchen counter." Mm. He he subcontracts with a what's called a stone fabricator, mm. and so they don't these, call them stoners because that's <laughs> it. Just feels right to me, but it's not. That would it? be a good nickname, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so a stone, a stone yeah. fabricator. Yeah. Um, so if you were in Australia where they've had a major problem with silicosis, you'd be called a stonemason. Ah. In this country. Classy, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we would call them the fabricators. Got it. Um, and these are the men, and, and I think they're almost all men, who are working in small shops. Uh, they will take the template from your kitchen counter, and they will cut these large slabs to shape. Um, so they're cutting out the, uh, the hole for your sink. Yeah. For your um, for your soap dispenser, they're cutting it to the exact curvature that you want in your kitchen. Uh, these fabricators are polishing, cutting, and grinding. You can imagine that if that's done without adequate ventilation or very wet, that you're going to get a lot of dry dust that's released in the air. Mm. And when that dry dust is inhaled, those silica particles they get down into the lungs and they cause this fibrosis, silicosis, which is one of the larger group of what are called pneumoconiosis. So, so how, what's the mechanism? The, the silicon particles are small enough that they can get, or the silica particles are small enough. This is not silicon, this is silica. This is silica. Yes, a mineralized silica, and it gets into the lungs past the usual defense mechanisms and settles somewhere and causes what, an autoimmune inflammatory reaction? It causes scarring mm. um, because of an autoimmune, because of an immunological response. Mm. So an immune response down in the very small airways or bronchioles and then into the alveoli themselves. Huh. Um, and what's also interesting and uh, somewhat alarming about these particular, uh, 
this particular kind of silica dust is that there is uh, autoimmune disease. Hmm. So that in some of the cases that we have found, uh, the initial presentation, the initial diagnosis has actually been rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma. Oh, wow. And these workers are going to the immunologist or the rheumatologist, and that's their initial diagnosis, and they're getting put on medication for autoimmune diseases. Wow, and, and those medications won't help with silicosis? Uh, this medication won't help with silicosis. The one that they were put on, it, yeah, right. Correct. It, so it's misdiagnosed in a worker where if people had an index of suspicion going, what do you do for a living? Well, I make these stone, these artificial stone countertops. If we actually were really beautifully trained, we would go, oh, let me ask you about this. Is there a lot of dust? Is there a lot of residue in the shop? Does your shop use a water process when you're grinding so that it captures the dust? Are there vacuums and ventilation? Do you wear a respirator mask? Would those well, be those are great questions. Those are all the exact questions that should be asked. So if a patient were to come in, um, person you know, or you see a worker, um, or you know someone who knows somebody, and they are short of breath, um, and they say, well, I'm a stone fabricator, I'm using artificial stone, then bingo, uh, the synapse should be to silica. Mm, but right now it's not at all. And in fact, you described the first case. How did you find that case in 2014? Um, what I love about occupational medicine is that <laughs> I can be a detective. Ah. I think in another life, I might have been Sherlock Holmes. That's all, Could I be Watson? You can be my Watson. I love it. I've always <laughs> wanted to be a Watson. Like, <laughs> not otherwise specified. Right. <laughs> okay. um, and that case came about because with some colleagues from the Centers for Disease Control, from their Occupational Research Institute, called the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, oh. NIOSH. NIOSH, yes. Yeah, NIOSH. Um, we just posted a blog on the internet and called attention to this potential problem in the, in the United States. Oh. And it was a knowledgeable and alert pulmonary doctor who wrote into the blog. It's the power of social media, it's the power of what a, you're doing. I'm a believer. Yeah. And that's a Justin Bieber fan, right. just in case you were wondering. But yes, also yeah. a believer in that. Right. Yeah. And so um, that's how the first case was uncovered. He had seen uh, an individual in his practice as a pulmonary doctor with silicosis. Mm. And he took an occupational health history, learned that this man had been a fabricator, worked in a company in Texas, um, and wrote a response on the website saying, oh, you know, Dr. Harrison, I had a case just like that. Uh, next day I called him and uh, he shared the information and uh, he wrote up the case with me. And that was the very first case in the United States. Wow. So there's so much there that's amazing because the internet, you know, we, we vilify it. Oh, people are going to Dr. Google. It's the erosion of our professional prestige. But the truth is, the data capacity, gathering capacity of the internet, the crowdsourcing of information. You had a astute pulmonary doctor who, by the way, doctors are big lurkers on social media, but they're not big contributors to social media. Unlike nurses who will just get in your face on social media, which is awesome. Doctors like to stay quiet. So it's really awesome that this pulmonologist, first of all, was astute enough to get the history, and second of all, to reach out to you and say, hey, this is what's going on. And I suspect that this could be replicated with a a bunch of other stuff if we were more cognizant of it. So that, that's an important point. So that, that's how you first discovered this 2014 case? Yes, that was the first case in 2014. Um, and since then, um, I have been waiting for the other sh shoe to drop. Because you probably anticipated, sense. yeah. Um, so I became aware of this back in 2012. Um, and this was a research paper from Israel. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Paul Blanc, who is also an occupational medicine professor at UC San Francisco, uh, Dr. Blanc and colleagues from Israel had seen 25 cases of pretty severe silicosis. There were several cases that uh, had lung transplants. Mm. Um, and these were in the stone fabricators in Israel. Wow. Now, why Israel? Well, remember I talked about the Italian patent in the mid-1970s. Um, that, that technology to make artificial stone 
was licensed by Caesar Stone. Caesar Stone is an Israeli company. Oh, wow. Uh, they operate out of a kibbutz in Israel. Yeah. And they began producing this product first for the Israeli countertop market. And so the fabricators in small dusty shops in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, elsewhere in Israel uh, began to develop pretty rapid silicosis. Wow. And that was the other um, interesting and somewhat alarming element of this was how quickly the lung disease developed. Well, so, so what's the standard way you would develop silicosis? Where do you typically see it before all this, before the stone uh, fabricator piece? Um, there are three major types of silicosis. So the first type, which is the most common, is called simple or chronic silicosis. Mm. And that's the form that I'm used to seeing as an occupational medicine doctor. Um, exposures are fairly low. Um, they occur over years. And what I see on an x-ray is uh, pretty mild fibrosis. Mm. Pulmonary function tests may be somewhat reduced. The person has a little bit of shortness of breath. Mm. Um, and that is seen over 15 or 20 years. Mm. Um, a second form is called accelerated silicosis. And that's what we have seen in the stoner cop, in the countertop fabrication workers. Um, exposure as little as a year, two years, and then the onset of pretty progressive lung disease in as little as three years, affecting relatively young individuals. So where the first form, the simple or the chronic silicosis affects in the 50s or 60s because you have that 20 to 30 year period. Mm. Um, most of the cases we're seeing around the world are individuals in their 30s and early 40s. And they have very chronic, they have very severe progressive lung disease. And this is not a reversible lung disease, correct? So it can progress, you can die from this. The important, here, the, the important point here is that if the disease becomes uh, to a certain point where it's beyond the mild form of disease, it now has reached a, a moderate to more severe form, even after the silic exposure stops, the disease can be progressive um, and can be uh, terminal or require a lung transplant, mm. um, which is why it's so important to recognize this early. Mm. Of course, to prevent the silica dust exposures to begin with, mm. make sure they're low, this material is fabricated under good engineering controls with a lot of water to keep the silica dust low. But if the exposure has occurred, is to do the proper medical testing and find the disease early because then the person can be removed from exposure before it reaches the point where disease is progressive. So what's the workup for it uh, if someone comes in the end, you're concerned about it? Uh, the first test is a chest x-ray. Mm. Well, we already talked about the history. Yeah. Just make sure you get that history. A plus, zoom in, all the things you mentioned to me. <laughs> hey, I was a pretty big gunner at UCSF back in the day. I can tell. I can tell you, this goes back, you know, you obviously learned from that one hour that you got. I, I mean, I'm, I, you know, it's funny, I, again, not to derail the conversation, but I was really affected by that lecture because it, 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 and to this day, I hold that with me. The occupational exposures are so important, and we, be, we really kind of minimize them. We're not good at taking histories, and whether it's asthma or any number of other things. So, anyways, back to this. So, the chest X-ray. So, the chest X-ray, um, and there's a specialized reading of that chest X-ray. Mm. That's called a B read. That's capital B, and that's a specialized reading done by somebody who's expert in reading chest X-rays for silicosis so it so happens my wife who's not here she's at stanford right now is a chest radiologist and so at some point it'd be fun to have you back and get her on the show and look at some of these x-rays um absolutely yeah, yeah um and um so a chest radiologist but they they also have a specialized training so it's subspecialized even it's beyond subspecialized that. even beyond a chest radiologist to be able to look at a film and classify it for silica or asbestos or coal. These oh. are the pneumoconioses. Interesting, and is there a different technique to how you do the imaging for the x-ray? Is it different? No, it's a standard chest x-ray. Standard AP, but the but, but the doctor who's looking at the x-ray has a certification. Got it. To classify it, um, it's according to uh, the location and the type of small 
uh, nodules and other abnormalities of pneumoconiosis. Interesting. And so that's called a B read. Yeah, I've never heard. I've never yep. heard of that. So that's fat. I'll right. ask her when she gets home. Yeah. Um, so, um, and it's so it's 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 more than a standard radiology read. Um, the second is a breathing test or spirometry, mm. um, and that's a, a screen to look at total lung capacity and airflow. Um, to look at that and see the pattern for. Uh, a restrictive a restrictive abnormality so, so you'll see restrictive mostly exactly yeah it's so a lower volumes and but you don't get a exactly. component of obstruction or any other uh generally not generally so not. Okay. so i so I, isolated I, restriction right isolated yeah. restriction yeah um and if either of those are abnormal and a person um has some respiratory symptoms shortness of breath mild cough chest tightness um they need then to be further worked up they need additional testing mm. at that point they need a chest ct scan which is much more sensitive for the detection of silicosis mm. um, and they need full pulmonary function tests right um, and that's going to include the diffusing Diffusion. capacity yeah mm -hmm. um, to measure the transfer of oxygen from the air into the circulatory system. So how is, and we'll just get into the weeds for a second, how is the diffusion capacity affected by this disease? Is it reduced? It is reduced. So it is, it's gonna affect diffusion, hence the requirements for oxygen, you're restrictive, uh, there's scarring, et cetera. And the chest X-ray read by a, someone who's certified, you can get a sense, go further in the history, make sure to see if they're having symptoms, make sure you have the occupational history, and then think about a high-res chest CT to get deeper into seeing Correct. Are you and what would you see on the chest CT? I'm curious. Um, you see um, interstitial fibrosis. Uh -huh. Sometimes you'll see some ground glass abnormalities. Right. So very nonspecific. Very nonspecific. Right. And that's where the occupational history yeah. is key because you could see that chest X-ray, and if you didn't know the occupational history, you could think, okay, autoimmune disease or idiopathic idiopathic lung disease. Well, and th this gets back to your beginning uh, discussion about the the person who was treated for rheumatologic disease. So can rheumatoid lung maybe look like that can Exactly. Ah, see so this is where this is why I think occupational medicine resonated with me as a young person because it is a detective story. You have to talk to the patient, you have to ask the right questions and you have to use your brain in eliciting a story from another human being. And if, without that, the technology will fail you because you can interpret those tests in a million different ways. Correct. I mean, in fact, in occupational history, I find fascinating on everybody and anybody. I love to find out what people do for a living. That's so cool. So I just ask them about what they do. Um, so you're at a party and you're just like, hey, so what do you do? Yeah, and, and, what, what and do I do? Then how what do you, do you do? follow? What, what's the next thing? Um, I say, what do you like about what you do? What are you proud of? What do you do well? Tell me what you do. How do you make this stuff? Um, I think Zubin, it, uh, it probably started when I was uh, seven years old and I was playing by myself in the room, making erector sets, making Lincoln logs, um, putting together model airplanes, taking things apart and putting them back together. Uh, for me, uh, my passion for occupational medicine really comes from understanding how things are made how do they get, how does that kitchen countertop get into my kitchen? Yeah. Who makes it? Where does it come from? Um, where does the food on my table come from? Um, who's producing it? Is it safe for them? What's it like to work outside in 110 degrees and pick my food? Do they have heat stress? What can I do to prevent that? But it all comes basically from really understanding that people are at work eight, 10 hours a day and no matter what they do, they have a story. And it's part of the, it's, it's part of the medical story. It's part of what I see um, all healthcare providers ought to be doing. It, that's a, such a beautiful description of it because it, it is, it's this kind of deeply human thing too, right? Like what are my, my fellow human beings doing at work? And we spend so much time, so much of our lives. It's not work life balance it's work-life integration is really what it is and so how does that affect you know i think about our anesthesiologist breathing in sevoflurane fumes you know and and the or i mean is, is that something you guys have ever looked at like you know you know one of one of the first cases i had right out of residency um was uh, an anesthesiologist who had been exposed to halothane in the early days of anesthesia ah. so before isoflurane which is actually safer um uh, we used to use halothane. Mm. Now, repeated exposure to halothane 
causes hepatitis. Oh, right. Chronic hepatitis. Right. I remember this. Um, was, this. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's one, of the, one of the reasons why we shifted away from using halothane because some of our patients would develop an uh, idiosyncratic or allergic type response to halothane. Yeah. Um, but anesthesiologists used to get this as well. Before it, there were good ventilation systems in the operating room. He developed chronic liver disease. Wow. And he eventually died of terminal liver failure. And that was one of the first cases that I ever saw. And, you know, see, that hits close to home for physicians and nurses and other healthcare professionals because this, this is one of us, right? And, mm -hmm. and they're dying on the job. And, you know, you can imagine a needle stick or other occupational hazards, but you don't think of, like, just breathing in, like, say, I don't know, bovi smoke in the OR. Has that ever been looked Oh, at? yeah. That's, uh -huh. um, that's a standard that's been under development and discussion for many years. So bovi smoke contains some pyrolysis products, you know, high temperature combustion of lung tissue can be irritating, needs to be done under good ventilation in the operating room. Mm, mm, mm. And do you, think it, do you think that's generally done in terms of operating rooms? Yeah, generally. Yeah. I mean, I think that the word has generally gotten out there. Mm -hmm. um, since I've been doing it for 30 years, um, there have been a lot of positive changes. Now, there's a lot of work that remains to be done, but I would say generally, um, in terms of the awareness of healthcare hazards, it was one of the first occupations mm -hmm. that really came to the fore. Um, when I first started out, we were using non-safety needles. Mm. I don't know if some I of remember the, them. some of your listeners or in your audience may remember. Um, there were not safety devices on needles. And there was a woman at uh, San Francisco General Hospital here in the Bay Area who became infected after a needle stick. She developed HIV. Um, and the unions, the healthcare worker unions campaigned and we passed in California the very first standard that requires safety needles. Mm -hmm. Since then, in 30 years, I have not been aware of a single case of HIV, of HIV exposure mm -hmm. and transmission mm -hmm. at San Francisco General or UC. And these are hotbeds of, I mean, I was yeah. there in the 90s I mean, you, doing you blood draws in the middle of the night yeah. on floridly viremic yeah. patients who are febrile and we had i think we had safety needles i yeah. recall that because they're harder to use in, in other words you have to really get the hang of it because you know it's not you know there's a way to, to to use them and um and i was thankful for them though believe yeah. believe it and and so so it's so fascinating because we start out with really lackluster controls and we all complain about regulation and stuff that's happening but this is about saving people's lives and back to the silic the yeah. silicosis people you have these companies right and it's not like these are necessarily bad people that are running the companies but this is a kind of a recognized risk right you want to reduce dust you want to use the water but the regulations aren't that strong inspections aren't really mandated i don't think and screening isn't a standard protocol for workers in these fields so are any of those things things that you would like to see happen or how would you like to address it there are very tough workplace standards for silica dust hmm. those were passed in 2016 oh recently just very recently yeah it was um in the last year of the obama administration hmm. Um, and those silica standards require that dust levels kept be very, uh, that are kept very low mm. um, and requires that those workers get the type of silica medical exams that I described to you, get that chest x-ray and breathing test, and then get referred for a specialist. Right. So the standards are very tough. Um, what we need is a combination of tough enforcement, mm. um, and we need help and consultation for the companies who are making or fabricating the products. Mm. Um, many of these companies are small. Mm. Um, they're working on pretty small margins. Um, you don't wanna pay a lot of money to put your kitchen counter in. Right. You're trying to save money when it's you're tight. redoing your kitchen. Yeah. Um, uh, you wanna get a product that meets your budget. Um, so these companies are working on pretty small margins. So they need help putting in good ventilation, uh, adequate water supply uh, for a small company that can be fairly expensive Yeah, if their margins are small. Um, and then we need education um, to raise awareness on the part of the workers who are doing fabrication um, and healthcare providers yeah. to be sure that they are taking good histories and they recognize and report. Mm. Um, and then finally, we need good systems in our public health departments um, to recognize and to track these cases. So as much as I like to think 
social media is great. And Bob Harrison putting with colleagues a blog that a pulmonary doctor notices and writes something. Um, that's not a system. Yeah. So we need a good system to be able to track and then uh, prevent these cases. So it's a combination, if you will, of the stick, you know, aggressive enforcement, and then a carrot with education. So we need a really good OSHA and we need a good public health system. It make, makes perfect sense. And one thing that I think I might add, it seems to me that these workers are, if you know, if the margins are low, they're probably low paid workers without a lot of other skill set. They might be afraid to come forth and complain about the conditions for fear of retribution, losing their job, being unhirable. Is that something that you think has come up? Yes. Yeah. Um, so you're exactly right. Uh, this This workforce, uh, is what I call precarious. Mm. Um, relatively small employers. Uh, they don't belong to a union, so they don't have that union protection, the rights um, that are protected from harassment or being retaliated against. Mm. If they were to get a, a silica medical exam and they were to be diagnosed with silicosis, I would advise that that patient worker no longer be exposed to silica dust. Mm. I don't want my patient to continue to have that hazardous exposure. It's their livelihood then. So yeah. it can be a choice between their livelihood and their health. And that, for someone who is not making a lot of money and mm. may not have a lot of other employment options, mm. is a really difficult choice. Um, and fam it's, it's really an line. ethical problem also for yeah. me as a doctor at times. Yeah. Um, I, I wanna do the right thing by my patient, I wanna give them the note that says, no exposure to silica dust. Uh, but I need to understand the consequence of that. If my patient takes that to his employer, right? they could be out of a job. right? And then they can't feed their family. Right, and, and respirators aren't gonna cut it, right? Respirators are the last line of defense. Yeah. Um, I've worn a respirator for some jobs around the house. Well, first of all, I have a beard you can see. Yes. So, so if, I, if I were a respirator, I'd have to shave my beard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't shaved my beard since I was 18 years old, by the way. <laughs> wow. That's like Dr. Phil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, um, respirators have to fit correctly. So they have to have a good seal. Um, and they're hard to wear for eight hours a day. Yeah. It's hot. It's, it's you're sweaty. Yeah, exactly. People take, they just kind of loosen it and then you're breathing in the dust and... Exactly. Yeah. So Zubin, so, when you're ready, yeah. we have a couple questions. Yeah, hit, hit us with some of those. Okay, so we have supporter Desiree Castaldo. She's asking, so what about the epoxy itself? Is that the problem? So what about the epoxy? Is, is there a problem with the resin they use or is it purely the silica? That's a great question. Mm. So polyester resin mixed with the silica, these little silica particles are coated uniformly with a polyester resin. And there's research going on now um, in Israel mm -hmm. at the basic cellular level to understand that possibly this polyester resin could cause a greater immune response, that there's something about the combination of the resin and the silica dust that makes this more hazardous than just the silica dust alone. So it's like an immune adjuvant like we put in vaccines to help immune response. Uh, it's a similar scenario theoretically. That is the possibility. Yeah. Yeah, and that's at the cellular level, mm. um, what some researchers are looking at. It's a great question. This is one of my supporters. They subscribe for like four ninety nine a month. They're like the best people on the planet. Great question. Other questions, Victoria? Yes, we have another one from another supporter, Tony Frankie. Oh, um, Tony, TF, what up, dog? <laughs> he said the microparticles can only be stopped with bio-warfare-grade warf filters. I think N95 would work also, I'm sure the doc will say. So is N95 sufficient for yeah. these? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So an, an N95 is probably sufficient mm -hmm. um, given the concentrations. So uh, an N95 roughly filters out um, hazardous materials at a ratio of 10 to 1. Mm. So in other words, let's say some, something is at a, a, a level of 10 parts per million in the atmosphere. Um, if you put on an N95, you'll get it down to 1 part per million inside the respirator mask mm. now that's in the ideal situation where you're wearing the right size and uh, it's fit correctly mm. Mm. and so generally speaking an n95 would do it n95 will do it 
other stuff, uh, Victoria? These are good questions. Yes, we have another one from Michelle Waller. Doesn't OSHA regulate PPE for different types of workers or because this is a newer type of artificial product? So does OSHA regulate uh, personal protective equipment for these sort of things? Yes. Yes. So the standard that I mentioned, that tough silica standard Mm -hmm. passed in 2016, um, requires respirators. Um, And OSHA regulates those under that tough silica standard. And there's also a general respirator standard for all workplaces that OSHA regulates. And that sets the parameters for when and what type of respirator should be used. And so absolutely, that would that would pertain to these workplaces. Interesting. Can I ask a question? So I imagine you must be called to be an expert witness in a lot of lawsuit stuff. Is that something you do as an occupational medicine physician? I do. So yeah. on two counts. One is uh, when uh, my patients have workers' compensation claims. Yeah. You know? Um, I report it, and then they try to get compensated, and that's disputed. Mm-hmm. Um, so I give opinions in those cases. Right. But also what are called third-party or toxic tort cases. Ah. Um, so some of your listeners might be surprised to know that a worker cannot sue their employer. What? So about 100-plus years ago, uh, every state passed workers' compensation laws. And that means that if I cut off my finger in a table saw, I don't have to prove that my employer did something wrong. Right. I can just file a workers' compensation claim, mm. and you know, hopefully, I get compensated for my medical care and my disability. But I've given up my right to sue my employer for intentionally uh, making a hazardous table saw. Oh wow! So so you're limited. I'm limited, yeah. mm-hmm. it's called the exclusive remedy of workers' compensation. Now that has an exception, mm. and that exception is uh, to bring a lawsuit against the manufacturer of the product that I use oh. in my workplace. Those right. are called third-party cases. I see, so that's a toxic tort. A toxic tort, about. exactly. I and see. so I've done some expert work in that arena also. I see, so if you or a loved one suffer from mesothelioma, Call us now at the law firm of blah, 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 blah. So in theory, if that case goes to trial, you might be called as an expert witness, et cetera. Correct. Yeah, got it. Correct. Um, and so I've done jury testimony over the years, um, explaining these difficult concepts we've been talking about on the air today to 12 lay people. It's an extraordinary system of justice we have in our country. Wow. Um, so explain... Explain what pneumoconiosis is <laughs> to 12 people. Right, right. And they're not medical students. They're not medical yeah, students. They're lay people. They're lay people. Yeah. Um, but they get it. Yeah, they do get it, I bet. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you have a good teacher. Um, other questions, Victoria? So I think we have one last question before we wrap up. Um, this is the final supporter, Brittany Bible. How much exposure does it take to elicit an immune response? How much exposure does it take, for, I imagine, for silica to elicit an immune response? So, like, it used to be seen in minors, I guess, and things like that. So, is, is there, like, a minimum threshold? There is. So, OSHA, you know, again, returning to the 2016 um, OSHA standard, mm. um, that sets a trigger amount of silica dust in the air, mm. and that's... You don't need to remember the number. Nobody will remember this. So many but nanograms. Yeah, yeah, but it's 0.25. Okay, so it's set, though. It's yeah. set. Yeah, it's set. And that will protect against silicosis. That'll protect against that immune response. Got it. So, you know, quick question as we wind up here. What's involved in training to be an Ahmed doc? So there's a fellowship, and... Is it, can you make a living doing this or is there just limited positions? Because I bet you there are people who are watching right now who are like, this is my calling. What's what they're talking about, this detective work and this caring about working people and that sort of thing is what I want to do. What, what are your thoughts? On there is a specialty training program. Mm-hmm. Um, we have one at uh, UC San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm the associate director of that program. Dr. Blanc, my colleague, is the program director. It's a two year program, it includes a master's degree in public health. Oh, it's part of it. Which is great. Yep, it's part of it. Um, um, And it's one of the happiest fields of medicine. It's ranked right up at the top of job satisfaction. What? In the field of medicine. 
It, 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 you guys don't have Epic? Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in November of 2011, when um, the electronic health record hit my office, you would have seen me in tears the next day, oh. um, about ready to give it up. I was there. Yeah, yeah, I was there when it went live. Yeah. yeah. Um, but since then, um, I've seen the true value. Yeah. I've seen the communication advantages um, uh, and uh, the management of my patient. Um, but no, occupational medicine in all seriousness um, is a great field. Mm. I've loved it every day. Mm. Um, uh, I get to go out to workplaces. I get to be a disease detective, uncover new things, try to prevent illness. It's like Dora the Explorer, except a dude with a beard. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, th this is really awesome. Like this, I'm so glad you could share this with us. And it's so important because the call to action is people need to recognize this specific disease, which we've been talking about, but also understand how to take a good occupational med history because it's so important, exposures and these sort of things. And, and I want to bring you back if it's okay, because we're neighbors roughly within 40 miles of each other. I'd love to bring you back to talk about stress in the workplace. How do you guys think about that? Things like mold, um, particular stuff relating to healthcare professionals and their occupational hazards. I, if you're game, I'd love to get you back to talk about those things. I would love to come back, thank that you. That would be so awesome. All right, fam, so guys, if you like the stuff we do, please, please, please share this video. Subscribe on YouTube, click the little notification bell so you get notifications, otherwise you won't know when we put out a video. Join our email list, all those links are in YouTube descriptions. And if you wanna support the show, you can subscribe on YouTube as a Super PAC member for whatever price you want to, or on Facebook for $4.99 a month, or on Patreon for whatever you wanna support us with. It really helps us do the kind of stuff we're doing. I wanna thank Bob Harrison for being awesome and rocking the most professorial coat I've seen yet on the show. Thank you, Zubin, and I wanna thank you again for paying attention in medical school. <laughs> You were great. Uh, you hear that, Dad? I did listen. My dad's always like, I bet you're just sleeping in the back, Indian guy. You know, you're just falling asleep. I know you because you do that at home when I'm telling you what to do. Uh, so I'm glad. Guys, I love you, and we out. Thanks to Victoria for handling the questions in the board. Peace. Not sure what that means, but I do it.